We're going to talk about the work of the Holy Spirit and, and how the Holy Spirit really works in our lives from before we're believers to when we become Christians and, and when we get filled with the Holy Spirit. So we're going to talk about three words, with, in, and upon. And those words are prepositions. Now, I know it's summer and you guys have already shut off school with your brain, but that's the only school I'll, I'll teach you today. So those are prepositions and, and that's all I'm going to say about that. I'm not going to get into too detail there. But, but the first word, the, the Holy Spirit is with you before you get saved. So we're going to talk about that word with. And we're going to talk about how the Holy Spirit influences the lives of non-believers. And then the second word in, the Holy Spirit comes in the believer. So when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and you put your faith and trust in him, we, we call that being born again or, or being saved. When you get saved, the Holy Spirit comes inside of you. And then the third word, upon, the Holy Spirit comes upon the believer when they get filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen? So with, in, and and upon. And so once we get to, to using these props here, this doesn't really do justice, but this is a depiction of the Holy Spirit. Now to, to really show the Holy Spirit, it'd be literally like containing oceans of water. Amen? Because God is that vast. He's that huge. So again, just, just play along and, and pretend that this is the, the Holy Spirit and that this is, this is mankind. This is us. Amen? So before we get saved, the Holy Spirit is with us, and that's what we're going to look at in the Scriptures. And as you listen here this morning, even if you are a believer, which I'm sure most of you are, I want you to listen with the ear of evangelism, of, of getting into the mind of, of a person that's a non-believer. Because, you know, if you've been saved for any length of time, I've been walking with the Lord for now 23 years. And sometimes we can forget how our thinking was, you know, when we first got saved, when, when we were lost. Amen? So again, I want to, to take you through Three, these three stages. And before we get into those, I want to talk about the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 16, turn there in your Bibles. John chapter 16, verse 7. The Holy Spirit is a person. We're going to look at that in here. And, and in this text, Jesus was basically telling his disciples that it was time for him to leave. And of course, they were sad and they were upset because they wanted Jesus to, to stay with them. But in John 16, verse 7, this is what he said. He said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper, say Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. The helper is the Holy Spirit. The helper will not come to you. So he's, he's, he's giving them, he's trying to calm them down. He's saying, hey, it's, it's to your advantage that I go away because when I do, the helper will, will, if I don't, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin and of righteousness and of justice, or of judgment, excuse me. So the Holy Spirit is a person. And the person of the Holy Spirit has a personality. He used the, the pronouns here, him, he, and he, right? So the Holy Spirit is, is not a thing. It's, it's not an it. It's, it's not some impersonal being. The Holy Spirit is a person. And he leads us, and he guides us, and he, he teaches us. He teaches us from the word of God. When you get Born again, the, the, the Bible finally starts to make sense to you because he teaches you. The, the, the Spirit is the teacher, amen? He convicts us, and, and we're gonna talk about that here this morning. He calls you, he empowers you, he helps you pray. He gives you spiritual gifts among many, many other things. So again, he is a person. He's a real person, amen? So the first point, the, the Holy Spirit is with you before you get saved. Turn in your Bibles to Psalms 139. Psalms 139. So the Holy Spirit is with you before you get saved. Now there's a, an attribute of God. It's called, it's called omnipresent. And this is what it means. It means that God is present everywhere at the same time. And his divine presence fills the entire universe. You think about that. He's everywhere at all times. And, and David talks about that in Psalm 139 verse 7. Here's what he says. He says, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and, and I dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. What's he saying here? He's saying God is omnipresent. He's everywhere at all times. So what do you mean to tell me, Randy? When, when you were thinking that thought, God was there? When you, you did that thing that, that you knew you shouldn't have done, God was there? 
You know, when you looked at that stuff that, that you know you shouldn't have been looking at, God was there. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere at the same time. And his divine presence fills the entire universe. He's always been there. Always been wooing you. Always been drawing you. Always been leading you. Amen? So why was he there all along? Turn back to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. We've got quite a bit of scriptures here this morning, so get your fingers warmed up. John 15, verse 26. Why was the Holy Spirit, why is he omnipresent? Why was he there all along and with you? John 15, verse 26, it, it, it says this. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, this is Jesus talking, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. That's one of the main things that, that the Holy Spirit does in the life of the non-believer. It, Jesus said, he will testify of me. So what, what's Jesus saying here? He's saying, hey, the, the Holy Spirit will tell you as a, as a non-believer about me. He's gonna tell the non-believer about Jesus. And one of the, the main works of the Holy Spirit is to open up the heart of the non-believer so that they can receive Jesus Christ as their Savior and, and they can experience that, that new birth, that, that new creation. If any man or, or woman be in Christ, they are a new creation. Old things are passed away. Be, behold, all things become new. The Holy Spirit is the one that, that works, that works, that, that opens up the heart of the non-believer so that the seed of the Word of God, God's Spirit of truth, can get in there and produce salvation. Amen? The, the, what we call that, that born-again experience. So it was the Holy Spirit with you that awakened your need for Jesus. Amen? And he's still with all of those that are non-believers today. All over the world. He's omnipresent. Impossible to wrap your, head, your mind around. But God isn't in human form. Amen? He's a spirit. And that's how he can be everywhere all at once. And if you try to, to wrap your mind around that, it'll, it'll kind of go tilt. Amen? It's like trying to think about eternity. But God said he's put eternity in our heart. We, we know these things. We believe them by faith. Amen? We know that we know that we know. Turn your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 3. So uh, uh, the first reason that the Holy Spirit is there for the non-believer is, is because he's testifying of Jesus to the non-believer. The second reason in, in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9, it says this. It says, The Lord is not slack or, or slow concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Youth group, what does all mean? All means all. He, he's not willing that any should perish. And what's that word slack mean? It, it means slow. God is not slow. And what's the promise? The, the promise is that Jesus is going to return. When he left, he said, he said, I am going to return. He's right now seated at the right hand of the Father, and it says he's coming back to, to judge the living and the dead. That's the promise. But what is it saying here? It's, it says he's not slack. He's, it's not slow in his coming, but, but he's long-suffering. He's extremely patient toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all, everyone, should come to repentance. So what is God's desire? It's, it's for everybody to repent. God does not want anybody to go to hell. You've got you've to have an understanding of that. That's God's heart. It's his desire is for everybody to repent. Now, does, does everybody repent? No, they don't. They don't. But we have got to have God's heart when it comes to non-believers. It says, delight thyself in the Lord and he will give you the de desires of your heart. What does that mean? As you spend time with God, as you spend time in his word, as you come to church, the heart of the Father should become your heart because you become who you hang around. And so God's heart for non-believers is that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Again, not everybody does come to repentance, but we need to believe in them. And I tell you, when I was more of an immature Christian, I, I was kind of flippant with some of these things. I think, oh, you know, that people group over there that, that doesn't believe the way I, I do, they're going to hell anyway. And that's a terrible attitude. That's a terrible heart. That is not God's heart. And so as you're listening here this morning, if, if that's your heart, you need to adjust that heart. We don't condemn people to hell. Amen? We pray for people. We love people. We believe in people. Amen? The same way people believed in you before you got saved and, and people believed in me before I got saved, that's what we're to do to non-believers. 
Amen? Never forget where you came from. Never forget where you came from. Amen? So he's God. Why, why doesn't he just make everybody repent and get this over with? He's God. He can do anything, right? No, he can't. God can't lie. God can't override what, what he's given you as a, as a free will. You've got a free will. He's not willing. His will is for nobody to perish, but for everybody to come to repentance. But we know that you have a will and I have a will as well, and we can deny and reject Jesus Christ. You don't need to turn there. Joshua 24, verse 15, it says this. And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers, uh, which, excuse me, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So you've been given a free will. Will. As Joshua said here, you've been given the power to choose. Really, it's the power to decide. Decide means to make a decision, to cut off every other option. When I decided to marry my wife, she cut off every other option of the the thousands of men that were lined up (laughs) that wanted to marry her. But she said no to all of them, and she said yes to me. Amen? She made a decision. That's the same way it is when we when we trust, put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, we make a decision. And that's what Joshua is saying. He's saying, choose this day whom you will serve. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen? Parents, your kids have been given a free will. They've got their own power to choose. Now, we're the biggest influence, influencers in their lives. But what do you do as a parent? You take the lead. You take a stand. You stand for the word of God. You lead with strength with conviction. Don't be wavering back and forth, amen? Be consistent because see, your walk talks louder than your talk talks. And if you're wishy-washy and back and forth, your child's gonna see that, amen? And even if they drift off for a season, here's what Revelation 3.20 says. It it says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anybody hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and I will dine with him and he with me. I'm telling you, the non-believer, they are hearing the voice of God. They may not know it, but I'm telling you, just like for you and I, God has move, is moving heaven and earth because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But now they've got to make the decision to open up the door, open up the door to their heart. Amen? So what do we do as parents? It's like we talked on Mother's Day. You, you pray for your kids. You believe in your kids, and you never give up on your kids. If you're around somebody at work that's a non-believer, what do you do? You pray for them, believe in them, and you never give up on them. You continue your walk. You don't become like them. No, you become more like God. You become more Christ-like. Not weird, not goofy, but more like Christ. And they will be drawn to the Holy Spirit who is in you. And that'll bring conviction upon them so that they can be opened up and they can receive Jesus Christ as their Savior as well. Amen? John chapter 3. John chapter three, we're gonna talk about the difference between conviction and condemnation and and talk about how the Holy Spirit causes the non-believers to make this decision. How does he do this? Conviction versus condemnation. John chapter three, verse 17, to set it up, this was when when Jesus was talking to to Nicodemus, right? It, It says this, for God did not send his son, he's talking about himself, he said, God did not send me into the world to condemn the world. I'm going to read that again. God did not send Jesus into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Ask you a question here. Does Jesus condemn the world? No, he does not. So should we condemn the world? No, because we're to be like Jesus. He's our example. What's that word condemn mean? It means to reject. It means to pass judgment on. It means to pronounce guilty. Verse 18, it says, he who believes in him is not condemned. I've got good news for you here this morning. If you're a born-again Christian, if you've put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you will never be condemned, you will never be rejected, and you will never be pronounced guilty because Jesus did away with all of that on the cross 2,000 years ago. And if you're slipping back into that, you've believed a lie from Satan. You've slipped back into the law. 
We don't live under the law. We live under grace. That doesn't mean we can just live any kind of way and, and do any kind of thing that we think about. Again, it's, it's like when I married my wife. I, I love her so much. I, I think about her. I want to spend time with her. I'm not, not thinking about anybody else. Amen? That's how it is when we, we build a relationship with God. We're so in love with him and we're so pursuing him that we, the world just doesn't hold anything for us anymore. Amen? That's true grace. That's true love. Amen? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Amen? Amen. Verse 18, go on. It says, he who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe, here it is, is condemned already. So the world is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. So why don't we condemn the world? Because they're already condemned. We don't, we don't go and heap more condemnation on a group of people that, that have already been condemned. Amen? We pray for them. We believe in them. And we never give up on them. Just like somebody did for you and, and, and somebody did for me. Again, the word condemn means to reject, to pass judgment on, and to pronounce guilty. Romans 8.1 says, Therefore, if any man, or, or therefore, now no com- condemnation Excuse me. There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. And you got to continue to live after the, the Spirit, but again, there's not judgment and condemnation in the life of a, of a born again believer. Amen? Turn back to John chapter 16. Bouncing around here again, but, but we read the scripture earlier. Again, Jesus is telling his disciples that I've got to leave. We're going to look at the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Conviction versus condemnation. So we looked at condemnation. Now let's look at conviction. Verse seven in in John 16 says, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Holy Spirit will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. And when he has come, here it is, he will convict the world of sin, he will convict the world of righteousness, and he will convict the world of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me. So the first thing that the Holy Spirit is going to do in the life of the non-believer is convict them of sin. And how does he do that? By convincing the non-believer that they are a sinner. And that's what, what has to happen. Before anybody can get born again, before anybody can get, get saved, they've got to first realize that they're lost and that they are in need of a Savior. They've got to figure that out. But see, as long as the person thinks that, that they're good enough, that, that they're religious enough, that they're, they're holy enough, they will never look to Jesus for salvation. And Jesus said it this way. He said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. That's who Jesus came for, those who are sick. Amen? But they've got to first realize that they're sick. That's what the lost person needs to recognize. And here's the thing. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict the world of sin, and he's an expert at it, and you are not. It's the Holy Spirit's job to convict the world of sin. Not our job, it's the Holy Spirit's job. Now I'm gonna show you some places where the Holy Spirit in in us does bring conviction, but it tends to to come off as condemnation if we try to do the convicting. Amen? I got saved back in in, in 2001, and, and Travis got saved, what was it, about 2007? 2009. A couple years later, a, another buddy in our same friend group got saved, and, and then yet another friend, I was in his office, it's probably maybe 2014 or so. Things were going really, really well in all of our lives. And I remember him saying, he, he was like, yeah, I, I know you got saved. I know Travis got saved. I, I know that other guy got saved, but he goes, I just don't think I've done anything bad enough to need to get saved from. And I'm like, well, you kind of ran with all of us. I mean, you know my story, right? I was a drug dealer up until 2001. Birds of a feather feather flock together, I'm just saying. But the Holy Spirit didn't lead me to start condemning him and start telling him about his lifestyle. But now as a result of him watching our lifestyle over the years, he's come around, amen? Amen? So you've got to be led by the Spirit. Sometimes God will will lead you into into saying something. Other times, he'll arrest your mouth and you've got to be led by the Spirit. 
Because again, many times when we try to do the convicting, try to say things just right or, or the certain way, it can come off as condemnation. And here's the thing. When they're ready, you can't say anything wrong. But when they're not ready, you can't say anything right. And you've got to be careful. There's got to be a relationship there because otherwise, a lot of times you can, you can end up pushing them away and, and doing more harm than good. Does that mean we don't evangelize? No, I'm not talking about that whatsoever. But again, just got to be led by the Holy Spirit. We're talking about the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? So it says the, the Holy Spirit will convict the world of sin. It doesn't say sins. It says sin. So what sin does the, the Holy Spirit convict the world of? John 16, 9, it says, of sin because they do not believe in me, speaking about Jesus. So it's the sin of unbelief. That's, that's the sin that the Holy Spirit will convict them of, the sin of rejecting Jesus Christ and not believing in his finished work. That's the sin. Because see, unbelief is the worst sin. Because if, if they're not forgiven of that sin, they're not forgiven of, of any other sins. Because again, what did we just read? They're condemned already. And it's the Holy Spirit's job to, to come in and, and, and do that work and, and to open up their heart so they go from being an unbeliever to becoming a believer. Amen? And putting their faith and trust in Jesus Christ and, and receiving him. Amen? Like I said, your life will bring conviction to the non-believer. How, what does that look like? If, if you're around somebody and, 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 and they, they apologize to you for swearing, that's conviction that they're coming upon. I, I never walk up to anybody and say, hey, the Bible says there shall no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. They'd think I was crazy. You know, Nick and I were in the gym a, a few months ago and there's a guy that, that uh, only uses four-letter adjectives between everything, right? But when he was around Nick and I, no curse words come out of his mouth. Then he went over across to the other side of the gym and and it's just every other word. I mean, I was like that before I got born again. But I told Nick then, I said, that's the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. I said, your life is a, is a witness. It's, it's ministering to him without you even opening up your mouth. Amen? It's, it brings conviction. <laughs> I remember before I got born again, oh man, I was coming out of Lewis Drug. So so I was a drug dealer, so I'd, I'd take money, cash in there, and I'd go in and, and I'd buy money orders, and then I'd ship the money orders out. So, of course, Slick Rick, you know, you go to a bunch of different Lewis drugs because you don't want to do too much cash, you know, at one time. And I'm coming out of a Lewis drug, and, and guess who was coming in? Pastor Mike. <laughs> now, Pastor Mike used to come to my gym before I was saved, before I came to church here. That, that was the connection that we had. And I'm telling you, I walked out, and he's like, hey, Randy. I'm like, hey, Pastor Mike, and I sat in my vehicle and the convicting power of God, I knew that he knew that what, exactly what I was doing. And I remember Trav telling me a story of when he was coming out of the bank and I was going in the bank after I was saved and he wasn't saved yet and the convicting power of God coming upon him. He thought I knew that I knew what it is that he was doing. And I probably did. I knew what, what time it was. We didn't go to banks except for one reason back then. But that is the convicting power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? But you do have to live a set-apart life. This isn't just some greasy grace and, and being just like the world. You've got to be set apart. It's not about being perfect in your own strength, in your own righteousness, but it is. There is a difference. There's got to be something different about you. Back to John 16, verse 8, it says this. And when he has come, he will convict the world of sin the second part, and of righteousness, and of judgment, of sin because they do not believe in me. Here it is, verse 10. Of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. So the Holy Spirit convicts people of righteousness, of non-believers of righteousness. So, so what does that actually mean? It means that, that he convinces people that they are not good enough in their own strength. Amen? Isaiah 64, 6 says, all of our righteousness are as filthy rags. They're, they're worth nothing. Amen? But see, the, the world tends to have kind of this, this floating scale, right? This balance of, of, of goodness and, and, and how they think they are. Now, in the end, they just think the, the good's gonna outweigh the bad. Now, on one end of the scale is, is 100%, it's perfection. They say, hey, God and, and Jesus, he's over there, 
right? But then on the other end of the scale, it's, it's like Hitler and, and, and Saddam Hussein and, and the guy that's on death row, you know, they're, they're way over there. And, and of course, I'm not as bad as those people. You know, I'm kind of somewhere in the middle. So they have that sliding scale and they believe like in the end, God is just gonna weigh that scale out and he's gonna say, you know what? You never murdered anybody. You didn't do anything crazy. And so I'm gonna let you in based on that sliding scale because nobody expects you to be perfect. But also, we're not on that end over there. But what does Jesus come along and say? In the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5.20, he says this, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. He set the standard. He said, man, the scribes and Pharisees, they're way over here. They keep the law. They, they do all of these religious things. And he said, uh, unless your righteousness exceeds those guys, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. And then at the very end of the, the Sermon on the Mount, verse 48, he says, therefore, he, he draws the line in the sand. He says, you shall be perfect just as your father in heaven is perfect. He says, the line is the 100%. You've got to be perfect just like your father in heaven is perfect. Now, thank goodness that word perfect means Mature, it means complete, but we know when we stand next to the perfect one, how do we feel? We feel imperfect. We feel unworthy. Amen? That's why we don't come in on our own righteousness. It doesn't matter what denomination you are. I grew up Lutheran or, or, or Catholic or, or Pentecostal. I gave, I, I, I served, I, I did all of these things. It says, no, your righteousness are like filthy rags. The standard is, is perfection. The standard is God. We can never impress God with our own righteousness because he is perfect. But praise God, because of Jesus Christ, the blood of Jesus, and not only covers our sins, but it cleanses our sins so that we can stand before God holy and blameless, set apart, amen? And that is the grace of God. You cannot do it on your own, but you can do all things through Christ. Amen? Amen. Amen. John 16, 11. So we looked at the Holy Spirit convicts us of sin. It, he, he convicts us of righteousness. The third thing in, in John 16, 11, the, the Holy Spirit convicts the world of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. Who's the ruler of the world? Satan. 2 Corinthians 4, 4 says, the little g God of this world has blinded the minds of those that believe not. You say, Satan's ruling the world? Well, look around. It's really the world's system. Amen? And when you got born again, you came out of the world's system, out of the kingdom of darkness, into the kingdom of light. And you operate by a different system, by the, the kingdom system, the, the kingdom that Jesus came to proclaim, to show you how, how it operates, seed time and harvest, rather than buying and selling, all of these different things. Now, we live in the system, we, we live in the world, but we're not of the world. Some heavy thought processes, but again, that's what it is here. So what's Jesus saying? He's saying Satan, the, the God of this world, has been judged and he is defeated. But he's also saying that, that the Holy Spirit is going to convict the, the world or the non-believers of that same judgment if they say no to Jesus, that they will have the same judgment as Satan did. Because what does it say? The world is already condemned. Remember, remember we read that earlier? We don't condemn the world. They're already condemned without Christ apart from Jesus. Amen? That's why it's so important that we pray for people. We believe in people. And we never give up on them. It's so important. Because somebody did that for you. So the Holy Spirit is always with the non-believer. Convicting of sin. Convicting of righteousness. And convicting of judgment. So what do we do with all this? What do we do with all of this conviction? The Holy Spirit is constantly pursuing the non-believer. In, in John 14, 17, it says this, the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him for he dwells with you and he will be in you. So once you accept Jesus Christ as your savior, you put your faith and trust in him he goes from being with you to becoming in you. Amen? And that's our second point, that the Holy Spirit comes in us when we get saved. Turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So the Holy Spirit is with 
the non-believer. And he comes in the believer when, when they put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16, it says, Do you not know that, that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? The Spirit of God dwells in you. You know, John Bevere's study drawing near that that we've been going through in small groups. This, this month, he's talking about as you draw near to God, God will draw near to you. When you, when you go to God in prayer, you're not hoping that he's going to show up. He said, as you draw near to him, he will draw near to you. You know, so many times when, when I didn't really understand the things of God, I thought I was praying to a God that, that was a million miles away. No, what does this say? He will not only be with you, he will dwell in you. So instead of looking up, look in. That's where the Holy Spirit is at. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. He's making intercession on our behalf. God the Father is on the throne, and the Holy Spirit lives inside of you if you're a born-again Christian here this morning, if you've put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That's how the whole thing works. The Bible says he never leaves you nor forsakes you. Amen? Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen? Amen. Romans chapter 8. Turn there in your Bible. Romans chapter 8. So he goes from being with us to being in us. Romans chapter 8, verse 9. It says this, But you are not controlled by your sinful nature. You are controlled by the Spirit if you have the Spirit of God living in you. And remember, those who do not have the Spirit of Christ living in them do not belong to him at all. Verse 10, it says, And Christ lives within you. Christ lives within you. He's inside of you. Amen? Christ lives within you, so even though your body will die because of sin, because we live in the sin-filled world, and we're going to die. The Bible says he's given us 70 or 80, or, or if you can believe up to 120, if you would want to live that long. But the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit, again, living within you. The Holy Spirit lives in you when you're a born-again Christian. Amen? There is a a third thing that that you can do, but but if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're heaven-bound. Amen? It says you're justified, just as if you'd never sinned. And you're being sanctified, which what means what? You're, you're being set apart. You're, you're, you're becoming more Christ-like, and that's a, a forever process until you, you go to be with the Lord. You're being sanctified on a, on a daily basis. Amen? So the Holy Spirit, God, lives in you. Amen? 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You getting something out of this this morning? You picking up what I'm putting down? Amen. You hear me clucking? It's good. Stay alert. Don't fall asleep. 1 Corinthians 12, 13, it says, For we are all baptized by one Spirit, so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free. What's he saying? It doesn't matter your background. I was looking out in prayer this morning. I was like, man, Faith Family Church is a melting pot. All different ages, all different backgrounds, all different you know, upbringings. But what is it? We all come together together. Because of Jesus Christ, amen? That's what brings us together. And that's what he says. We were all given the one spirit to drink. So the, the Holy Spirit, what's it say? It, it baptizes us into the body of Christ. What, what does that mean? It means the church. You're part of the church body, amen? Not, not the church building, but the church body. You've been baptized into that because of, of your relationship, your acceptance of Jesus Christ. And because the Holy Spirit has come in you, that means that you are baptized into the body of Christ. You have joined the army. Welcome. Amen? Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, it says, And such were some of you, but, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. When the Holy Spirit comes in you, he says you're washed clean. Your, your sins are not wiped out. They're not covered. 
Yes, they are wiped out, excuse me. They're not just covered like they were in the Old Testament. They're completely washed clean. He said he separates as far as the east is from the west. You're squeaky clean. So if you're sitting there remembering how bad you were before you got saved, that's because you're remembering that. You're falling into condemnation, rejection, and, and, and judgment. God is not doing that to you. He says you're free. Whom the Son has set free is free indeed. But you've got to understand your identity. You've got to understand your position. Again, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things are completely passed away, and every day it's brand new, amen? So it says he washes us clean. He, he sanctifies you. Like I said, it, it's, he's setting us apart to become more Christ-like, and he justifies you just as if you had never sinned. You know how God sees you? He sees you the exact same way that he sees his son, Jesus Christ. Washed clean, sanctified, and justified. And I'm telling you here this morning, if that's making your mind go tilt, you got to start meditating on the scriptures. Who does God say that you are? Because anything apart from what I'm teaching you here this morning is a lie. And where's the, the lies come from? Satan, the father of lies. Amen? You're washed clean, you're sanctified, and you're justified. You're set apart. You're a royal priesthood. You're a, you're a holy generation, but you've got to see yourself as that. You're the head and, and never the tail. You're above and, and never beneath. You're purified in his sight, amen, because of the, the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Now we're all at different stages of the game. It's just like an infant. An infant, you know, we have different expectations on an infant than a, than a toddler, than, than somebody that's at fourth or fifth grade, and a, a high schooler, and, and somebody that's an adult. That's that process of sanctification, that, that growth process. And we as Christians, we have to allow that process for new believers to go through, amen? And so many times, you know, it's, it's somebody comes in with, with these issues, and the world is facing so many more issues than they were even, even 10 years ago. You know, addictions and anxiety and depression and just all this stuff. And I'm not minimizing anything. Trust me, I had my own issues when I came in. But praise God that, that you all were patient with me and taught me and discipled me along the way and allowed me to grow up. But if that new believer stumbles along the way, it's not our job to condemn them. It's our job to lock arms with them and pick them up and walk alongside of them, to pray for them, to believe in them, and never give up on them. Amen? Because remember where you came from. Remember where you came from. Don't ever forget it. Amen? Amen. So the Holy Spirit is, is with the non-believer. The Holy Spirit comes into the believer. And the third point here, and we're not going to go into detail with this today. We'll, we'll cover this in, in, in detail Wednesday night. But the Holy Spirit comes upon us when we get filled. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Acts chapter 1, verse 8. It says this, but, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. There's that word, upon you. And you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So what happens when the Spirit comes upon us? This is what happens. He overflows. Amen? Amen. And he, what does he do? You shall receive power. What is this power for? It's for everybody around you. Amen? Amen? He empowers you to, to go out and do the, the works of the ministry. Are you lesser than if, if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit? No. You're still heaven bound, but again, God, I, I was always like, I want to have all of God. I want everything that he has for me. Amen? Put me in. Put me in the front lines. Amen? It's what I wanted. And when the Holy Spirit come upon me, I'm telling you, it charged things up. It went to a whole nother level. Amen? This is how Peter went from denying Jesus three different times. Remember? He said, before the cock crows, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter's like, I'm not going to do that. And sure enough, to a little girl, he ends up cursing Jesus to her face because he, he was afraid. He was a man pleaser. That's what he was. But lo and behold, when the Holy Spirit came upon him and he got filled what does it say? He preached to 3,000 and 3,000 people gave their lives to the Lord. Amen? Like I said, Wednesday night, we're going to go through 
and I'm going to teach you step by step receiving the Holy Spirit as well as what the Holy Spirit does in the life of the believer. Amen? This overflowing. So what is God saying to you here this morning? We all know non-believers. We all have people in our lives that, that, that don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Hopefully this gave you a, a greater awareness of what is going on in their life, the, the convicting power. And I'll say this, if, if you are living with somebody that's a non-believer, a spouse, a, a family member, you're around them quite a bit, maybe at work or whatever, your life, the Holy Spirit in you, is bringing conviction to them. And that's very uncomfortable for the non-believer. And so many times they'll, they'll kind of lash out because they don't know what's going on inside of them. I told my story many times. When, when I gave my life to the Lord and I was down in a jail cell and I, I mean, I had a potty mouth and a few days in, all of a sudden a, a four-letter word come out and I'm like, man, that doesn't sound right anymore. And then I walk by a piece of paper and something tells me to go back and pick it up and I'm like, What? is happening to me. I don't care about anything or anybody other than money and me, and now all of a sudden, God is changing me. Melissa would come visit me, and I'd, I'd tell her to get down here to church. God was, was taking the things that I used to love and, and be into, and, and I just didn't have a desire for them much anymore. And then the things that, that I could have cared less about, going to church, reading my Bible, spending time around other believers, now all of a sudden I had a desire, that's all I wanted to talk to, to Melissa about. And the same thing was going on in her life. Amen? That's, that's the Holy Spirit doing that new work on the, the new creation, the, the, the new believer. Amen? And I'll tell you, you've got to, we are the hands and feet of Jesus. You know, when I was a fitness professional, we owned a gym for, you know, on and off for, for basically like a 25-year period. And when, I, when we got saved, you know, myself and, and, and Travis, he saw, him, you know, many others that worked for us, we had a, a team of believers. And it was just such a, a unique environment and experience because, man, people would come in and they'd say, they'd say, there's something different about this place. When, when I leave, I feel better than when I came. And we understood how this all worked. We, we, we met their needs. We'd help them, you know, drop fat or put on muscle or, or do whatever it is that they wanted to, to do. But as we built the relationship with them, it would open them up. And there are many people sitting in here today that are a result of, of that gym relationship. Many people that have come through here that, that are a result of that gym relationship. But, but the convicting power of the Holy Spirit that lived in us ended up saving them, amen? And that's how the whole thing works. When you're out in your workplace, you're first a Christian. The Holy Spirit lives in you. Yeah, you might be an accountant or a police officer or a salesman or whatever it is that you are, but you're first a born-again Christian and the Holy Spirit lives in you. And that's your world. Yes, when Rabbi was here and, and hearing about Israel and Hamas and, and man, my heart goes out, but but. I don't feel called to go over there and do anything about that. I'll pray for them. We're called to do that. But what am I called to do? I'm called to be a, a, a godly husband to my wife, a godly dad to my boys, a godly man to my, my neighbors, and when I go out into the marketplace, because the Holy Spirit lives in me. And for some reason, even though it's been 23 years ago, and, and when I tell my story, it's like I'm telling somebody else's story, it's like it was yesterday when I got born again. And I might not be as on fire as I was back then. I, I, I lost some of that. Why? Because you, you, you become so, honestly, like too smart for your own good. Back then, I just fire hosed everybody. And it was great. I was passionate. It's like giving a little kid a loaded shotgun. Boom, boom. You're just, you're, you know, I wrote letters. I wrote letters to my father-in-law. I said, hey, Steve, I love you, but you're going to hell. Pray this prayer. <laughs> Amen? Because I went from being in black and white, and when the scales came off, it was like being in 3D, living color, 4K, amen? I finally saw. I was free, and I wanted other people to be free. Amen? So what is God speaking to you this morning? If you're around non-believers, don't get frustrated with those people. They don't know. They don't know. You can't explain the supernatural but you can experience it. 
It's just like Rabbi. God bless him. We love Rabbi. But he's not born again. He reads the scriptures from the carnal mind. But I'm telling you, once he gets born again, once the Holy Spirit comes in and illuminates that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, hallelujah, imagine the force that he's going to be. So we pray for him. Don't condemn him. Don't judge him. Same thing with the people you're around in your workplace. Don't get frustrated with them. Birds fly, fish swim, sinners sin. We were really good at it. And this whole Christian deconstruction, have you all heard that? Young people are into deconstruction. They're deconstructing their faith. I can't even wrap my head around that. I say you need to get born again. How can I deconstruct a man, Travis, that was a functional meth addict, living in a basement, calls me up one day and says, hey, I've changed my phone number. I've done all this different stuff. I bring him to church. He comes in one way and he leaves a completely different way. There's a 7% success rate for methamphetamine. He gets prayed for, comes in one way, is supernaturally delivered. How do you deconstruct that? Or how about my friend Michelle? Same thing. Travis gets born again. He gets set free. She comes in. Same exact thing. There was a process of time. For her, it was when she got filled with the Holy Spirit, she got completely set free. How do you deconstruct that? So many other people I look at in here. Who they were before Christ and who you are now. How do you deconstruct that? How do you explain that away? It's because no faith. You can't reason this stuff out. Travis goes into the, the treatment centers and he, and he explains his story and he, he tells about what happens and what are they trying to do. Trav, tell me what you did. Did you, did you change your phone number? Did you, did you do this? He said, no, I accepted Jesus Christ and he completely set me free. I did one thing. But again, that, it makes no sense because this has to be experience. It's a born again experience. And so if you're here this morning, and you're this empty vessel. Man, Jesus has got peace for you. I remember sitting in a jail cell. It was the first time I got a, a good night's sleep because I, I had peace. I knew that I knew where I was going. Amen? He wants to come in. He wants to come in. So if you're here this morning and You've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior. You've never put your faith and trust in him. What does that even mean? God just wants to have a relationship with you. He is a good father. And I know for some people, when you hear the word father, you relate it to your earthly father. God is only good. The Bible says God is love. He wants the best for you. He just wants to have a relationship with you. How do you do that? The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord and, and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, it says that you will be saved. Your sins will be forgiven. You'll be washed clean. You'll, you'll be justified. You'll be sanctified. You'll be made right with God. How awesome is that? This, this perfect, holy God. And you can come before him and he sees you as perfect and holy because of what Jesus Christ did for you. But it's a free gift, and you've got to accept it. And by not accepting it, we're already condemned. I'm, I'm not saying that. The Bible says that. It says that we're already condemned. We're already lost, but you've got to realize that. Jesus didn't come for, for healed people. He came for sick people. So if you're here this morning and the Holy Spirit is convicting you, what does that mean? He, man, your heart's beating, and you're saying, man, I, I need to get right with God. I don't care whether you've You've prayed a prayer or you've drifted away. I don't care where you're at this morning. This is a hospital. This is where sick people come to get made well. Amen? Thank you for watching the message. I'd like to give you an opportunity to make Jesus the Lord of your life. Would you pray with me? Just say, Jesus, come into my heart. And Jesus, I make you Lord of my life. Thank you for saving me. If you prayed that simple prayer, we believe that you got born again. Make sure that you get into a Bible-based church like Faith Family. Read your Bible daily, starting with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Surround yourself with godly friends who will help you grow in your relationship with Jesus. 
We trust that you're encouraged, strengthened, and ready to fight the good fight of faith. Make sure to hit the like button, subscribe to our channel, and share this message so that we can reach more people to fulfill our mission of strengthening families through God's word. Let us know in the comments below if you gave your life to Jesus or how this message touched your life. We would love to hear from you. God wants you to know that he's for you, not against you. We love you, we're praying for you and your family, and we'll see you next time.